nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs> Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. Breaking news. Sister Megan Rice, 84, was sentenced to two years and 11 months in prison for her peaceful protest at the Y-12 National Security Complex, a nuclear weapons plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Details next week on Nuclear Hot Seat. The big story this week is from the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, which has experienced two accidents in the last week and a half. We'll have two interviews on the latest developments there, plus an interview with Indian filmmaker Pradeep Indulkar, who is currently touring the United States with his award-winning film, High Power. Those interviews, plus Num Nuts of the Week and the Radcast Radiation Weather Report, will all be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 18, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Last week on Nuclear Hot Seat, we reported on a fire at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, WIPP, or WIP as it's currently known, outside of Carlsbad, New Mexico. The fire was attributed to a diesel truck that caught fire and was burning underground. Then last Saturday, February 15, came word of a radiation leak at the facility. The incident prompted an immediate shutoff of filtered air from the facility into the environment, and non-essential personnel were not allowed on the site. As of today, the Energy Department has suspended normal operations for a fourth day in a row at its New Mexico burial site for defense nuclear waste. The cause of the radiation leak inside salt tunnels, where the material is buried, is not yet known. Officials said little about the extent of the problem or how it could be cleaned up, how long the repository would be closed, and the effects on the Defense Nuclear Cleanup Program were unclear. Edwin Lyman, a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, said, The extent of the cleanup operation necessary to get the repository back in operation depends on the intensity and range of contamination in the underground tunnels. It could be a mess. If there is airborne contamination and it involves plutonium, they are going to need to decontaminate. If it is in the ventilation system, it could have spread. According to the Carlsbad Current Argus, airborne radioactivity levels aren't yet low enough to allow non-essential personnel back on site. Russell Hardy, director of the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, was told the information on Monday by an employee of the Nuclear Waste Repository. His group has been monitoring the air quality in and around WIP since the 1990s. It tests for radiation contamination at the facility by collecting a filter from the exhaust shaft each morning. But the last air filter sample the group has is from Friday, before airborne radiation was detected downwind in the South Salt Mine. Russell Hardy said, it's my understanding that at some point in the near future, we will be allowed to collect our filters, and at that point we'll be able to do our analysis. Our mission is to report whatever we find. To gain further insight in the story, I contacted Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center, a 43-year-old nonprofit organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that works on a variety of energy, natural resource and environmental justice issues, including nuclear waste and the WIP site in Carlsbad. I caught up with him in his office earlier today to ask him about the problems at WIP. There have been two incidents in the last two weeks, a fire in the underground, and this WIP is a salt mine, so a fire in the underground mine, 
and then a radiation leak. So those are two unrelated events in the sense that the fire didn't cause the radiation leak, but they're related in the sense that they're part of what I've been concerned about for the last few years in terms of WIP, which is a Department of Energy nuclear weapons facility falling into the same disease that other Department of Energy nuclear weapons facilities have, namely that they get complacent with what they're doing and they decide they're doing so well they can do other things. And what results in, from that is that accidents then start happening because they're diverted. Their attention is on things other than what they should be on, on the one hand. And they're spending time, effort, and taxpayer money on things they shouldn't be working on. What ongoing issues are there regarding specific safety issues at the plant? Two most obvious safety issues are... In the last two weeks, they, they had an underground fire. The fire wasn't supposed to happen. The fire was supposed to be able to be put out by the workers, and it wasn't. Then the fire was supposed to be put out by the fire suppression system, and it didn't work either. So you have an accident that shouldn't have happened that wasn't able to be a small fire that wasn't able to be put out by either of the supposedly foolproof methods. Then last Friday night, for the first time, they got a radiation leak, in other words, waste that's in the underground. And this is a salt mine, 2,150 feet below the surface. So some amount of waste in the underground, one or more containers of waste in the underground, apparently sprung a leak and leaked out radiation that was detected. We don't know how much radiation leaked, and we don't know what specific radionuclides, presumably plutonium-239, which is the major radioactive element that's in the ground at WIP, but of course there are lots of other radionuclides that are in the waste as well. But we don't know specifically the radionuclides that leaked and don't know how much that they leaked out, in part because typically there is three-part testing of the air filters at WIP, the DOE, the WIP folks at DOE get them and test them. And then there are two other entities, uh, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring Center in Carlsbad and the state of New Mexico's Environment Department. To my knowledge, neither the state nor the Carlsbad Center have gotten any filters since the radiation leak was detected. So at this point, the only people that may know what radionuclides and how much was released is the OE, and they aren't saying. What do you see happening from this? We have a hard time from a distance understanding how this is playing out for you and what the issues may be and what problems you might have in getting the information. Do you have any direct connections with information that perhaps make an end run around the DOE or the officials to get you some information from the inside? Well, there are two answers to that question. One is WIP is not a classified facility. It deals with nuclear weapons waste, not nuclear weapons themselves. So there's not supposed to be any classified information about WIP. So on the one hand, Pretty complete information should become available on both of these accidents that we've been talking about, but how long that's going to take remains to be seen. I believe it's the case that there will be some independent investigations of these two incidents, and I believe there will be a lot of information made public eventually. So one answer to your question is I think we will eventually get pretty complete information about what happened. Now, the second part of the question, you're in essence saying, are there whistleblowers or people on the inside who will talk to me? The answer is yes, on occasion. And people more frequently and more likely do that when they think something's happening 
that the Department of Energy and the WIP officials and their contractors are trying to suppress. Do you get the sense that there is anything being suppressed, meaning beyond just delayed, but really being eliminated from the information flow at this time? Not that I know of. If there's something being suppressed, I would expect I would start hearing about it soon over the next day or so. I know the workers at the site had a briefing with the top managers there this morning. So if any or all of those workers are unsatisfied with what they're hearing from management, some of them, one or more of them is likely to start talking to me or people like me about what's happening so that we do get more information out. But as I say, right now there are very few, if any, people who fully know what's going on up to and including the DOE and the the contractors that manage the site. Are inessential personnel still told to stay away from the facility? No. Let me expand on that a little bit. When the radiation leak was detected in the underground, 2,150 feet below the surface, there were no workers actually there in the underground. There were workers on the surface, of course. The facility operates 24-7, of course. So there were workers on the surface, and everything that I have heard, and I believe it's likely to be true, is that all of the workers on the surface were checked, and no radiation was found on any of them, and I hope that's true. At this point, I would expect that that is true. At the last I've heard is no workers have yet been allowed to go underground, which is bad news in the sense that it means that the leak could be somewhat serious. In other words, if it was a small leak and it all came out right away on Friday night and Saturday morning, why the radiation levels should be down to Zippo, and so they would say it's okay for workers to go underground. My understanding is they haven't let workers go underground, which you know, we're now more than 48 hours into the incident, and so that's a problem in the sense that apparently they're still detecting some amount of radioactivity in the underground, and they don't want to send workers down yet. So at some point, just to jump ahead a little bit, at some point, if this problem can persist, and they decide they want to send some workers underground, even if it may not be totally safe, that would be a big deal. I'm hoping that that doesn't happen, but at this point we don't know yet. So that's why I say no. At this point, I don't know that there's been a direct effect. The indirect effect is that we also don't know is, so the radiation is in the underground and it's coming up a shaft to 2,150 feet at the surface where that radiation is supposed to be captured almost totally by some filters, some what are called HEPA filters. So we don't know how well those filters are actually working, and the problem with plutonium-239, the predominant radionuclide at WIP, is in less than microscopic quantities, if you breathe it in, it causes fatal lung cancer. So what we want to avoid on a small scale at WIP is what we tried to avoid on a big scale with nuclear bomb testing when we did a we, the U.S., China, Russia, India, et cetera, did above ground testing of nuclear bombs. A lot of plutonium-239 was put into the atmosphere and it falls out over days, years, and even long time people can breathe it in. WIP is much smaller scale than a bomb explosion, but we don't want even the smaller amounts of plutonium-239 in WIP to escape into the atmosphere because then it's a threat not just to the immediate workers, but you know, depending on what air patterns are, et cetera, to people far away. One last question. From a distance, it seems like an amazing coincidence, you can put that word in quotes, 
that there was what was reported as the truck crash and the fire last week, and then just a few days later, there's a radiation leak. What makes you believe that they are separate issues as opposed to possibly connected? As I said, they're connected in the sense of operational sloppiness and complacency. They should not be related in terms of fire causing radiation leak for two specific reasons. One is based on what we currently know, the fire in the underground vehicle, the diesel powered vehicle that caught on fire was at least 1500 feet away from any waste. So the fire, there was no real way that the fire could spread 1500 feet and there's not supposed to be any waste anyways near where the fire occurred. One reason. The second reason is if the fire was related to the radiation leak, the radiation leak should have happened within a day or two of the fire and it happened nine days after the fire. And the fire's been out by all information, and it, ha it would have to be out at this point, essentially. The fire was out for days before the radiation leak occurred. So they have to be unrelated in that sense, unless there was a constant radiation leak from the time of the fire, and it wasn't detected for nine days. And I, that's extremely unlikely that that happened. So it sounds like these are both pieces of evidence about a culture of complacency at Correct. best. Correct. Well, but that's what, what, what happens typically at Department of Energy facilities, you have these quote-unquote small accidents, and then you have a big accident. And what I, I didn't want small accidents to happen, and I certainly don't want a big accident to happen. So the facility is shut down now. No more waste is coming in. I mean, there's a lot of waste there, but no more waste is coming in. No more waste is going to come in for a while, presumably at least a month, and hopefully maybe longer than that if that's necessary, so that we have independent investigations of both of these incidents, full public information disclosure about what actually happened and what may or could or should be done to avoid future little accidents or big accidents in the future so that this doesn't happen. That's the kind of thing I want to see done, and until those investigations are done and we have full public information of a lot of things that we don't know today, I think the facility needs to stay closed down. That was Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center. We'll have a link to him on our website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode number 139. Regarding that radiation, we heard from Mimi German of Radcast, who has been attempting to get those EPA numbers for us. Here's what Mimi had to say. The officials tell us that airborne radioactivity detected over the weekend at the waste isolation pilot plant is dropping, but that levels aren't yet low enough to allow non-essential personnel back on site. I'd been talking to a reporter from Carlsbad about this. Actually, he called me to ask me if we had questions for the DOE. I told him that the most important thing that we could learn from this is how high were those readings when the alarm was tripped and how high did those readings go? The readings that we need in order to put the whole picture together from either the NRC or the DOE are two sets of readings. One is the actual measurement that came that tripped the alarm and how hot that was. The other is what was the dose rate that affected the people there which created the evacuation in the first place? Well, we didn't get any of those answers. His name is Zach and he asked the DOE these questions yesterday and they told him that they did not know what the readings were. I have talked about the language of obfuscation in the past by the nuclear industry, of which I include the DOE, the NRC, the IAEA, and the EPA. This would be one of those moments. The DOE has stated that they do not know what the readings were when the alarm was tripped or how high they went or what the radioisotopes were that were released, but somehow 
They can tell us that levels aren't yet low enough to allow non-essential personnel back on site. How can you not know what the readings were if you're telling us in the same breath that the levels aren't low enough to not allow non-essential personnel back on site? And how can you not know what those readings were to call for an evacuation? The last time they called for an evacuation that the numbers were high at the WIP plant was back in 1999. This is not a normal occurrence. Mimi German. And we'll be hearing more from Mimi during the Radcast Radiation Weather Report later in this program. In more U.S. news, a fire broke out at the southwest corner of the Bridgeton Landfill dump last Sunday morning, February 16. The site is of concern because a subsurface fire has been burning deep within the landfill for several years. Concern has grown about that fire over recent years because residents have learned of radioactive waste buried in the adjacent West Lake landfill, which is in the direct path of the subsurface fire. This current fire was put out within a few hours, but the technicians who monitor the facility 24-7 failed to call first responders to report that news. Can't hide it, guys. Now the Bridgeton Landfill LLC is in talks with local officials to make sure they get their communications right the next time there's yet another fire at this site. Time for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission duck <laughs> and cover report. At the Davis-Bessey Nuclear Power Station, just 35 miles east of Toledo, on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, an unfilled area, love their languaging, was discovered in the concrete along the top of the shield building construction opening. The condition was discovered during the current steam generator replacement outage and is likely due to not completely reboring the shield building wall opening in 2011. In other words, a gap in the concrete containment because, oops, they forgot to pour it. At Sumner Nuclear Power Plant in South Carolina, there was a non-emergency emergency. Only the government could come up with language like that. This is because an earthquake was felt in the control room of Unit 1, another Valentine's present to us all, courtesy Mother Nature. Possibly caused by fracking? We'll have to find out. And at Nine Mile Point in New York, Unit 2 experienced a partial loss of off-site power. And as listeners to this program know, loss of off-site power is what can cause a situation like Fukushima. Just another in the NRC's usual, unusual occurrences. And that's today's talk <laughs> and cover report. This story was Num Nuts of the Week a while ago. It's come back, and it is real close to having that title again. In rural Washington, health so-called experts are at a loss when it comes to pinpointing the source of an alarming rise of deadly birth defects. In the three years prior to January of 2013, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that there had been 23 cases of anencephaly, a birth defect in which a child is born without parts of their brain or skull, reported in three Washington counties, Benton, Franklin, and Yakima. The CDC report stated, a clear cause of the elevated prevalence of anencephaly was not determined. CDC expert Jim Cusick speculates that the cluster of defects could simply be an unfortunate coincidence. How lemony snicket. Allison Ashley Koch a professor at Duke University Medical Center for Human Genetics told NBC that considering the three affected Washington counties contain a significant agricultural presence, the anencephaly cases could be linked to prolonged exposure to pesticides or mold. So with all these experts, what is the one word that is not being spoken? Hanford. The Hanford site one of the most radiologically contaminated places on the face of the planet happens to be right smack dab in the middle of that three county cluster. It is located in Benton County, Washington, and both Franklin to the east and Yakima to the west are adjacent. 
you think radionuclides might be implicated perhaps on at least the same level as agricultural pesticides? If you don't think so, here's one other piece that nuclear hot seat offers. There's one other place on the face of the planet where clusters of anencephaly exist. That's in Fallujah, Iraq, where depleted uranium bombs were exploded during our war over there. The radiation contamination is so bad in Fallujah that young women are advised not to have children because there is absolutely no guarantee or even expectation that they will get a healthy, live birth. You think that might have some relevance to the story in Washington State? That's a former numbnuts that just missed getting it again this week. But here now is the real Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat. Numbnuts of the week. This also revisits a previous numbnuts with an update. This is about the kids cancer seminar that is set to take place in Fukushima on March 29 of this year. It is affiliated with the 52nd annual meeting of the Japan Society of Clinical Oncology and their colorful posters touting the event carry the catchy slogan, especially because this is Fukushima, we need the best cancer education in Japan. Now, Beverly Findlay Kameko reports that a phone call to the organizer of this kids' cancer seminar, which, by the way, is aimed at fifth and sixth graders, reveals that the doctors at Fukushima Medical University, including thyroid specialists, are the ones who decided on the creepy subtitle for this poster. The poster was distributed at all 51 elementary schools in Fukushima Prefecture, meaning it covered all 5,400 children. And this was to fill just 24 places in the seminar. When asked about the intent of the subtitle, the event organizer was unable to answer and said that the doctor in charge would be contacted. When asked why Fukushima in particular needs cancer education for children, the organizer was again unable to answer. Duh! I guess foot was too far down the throat or perhaps up the posterior. Leave it to the doctors at Fukushima Medical University to change something that could be seen as fairly benign into a malignant piece of propaganda. And that's why, again, this seminar for kids dealing with cancer is this week's None That's Not A Week. More news from Japan. Two massive cracks, possibly caused by freezing temperatures, have been found in a concrete floor next to tanks where radioactive water is stored at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Workers on patrol discovered the cracks, stretching 12 meters and 8 meters respectively, meaning 39 feet and 26 feet. This was found near a group of storage tanks. TEPCO detected up to 58 becquerels of radioactive cesium and up to 2,100 becquerels of radioactive strontium per liter of melted snow in the area. This next story comes to us from Informable and Lucas Hickson. This week, TEPCO released new photos, and an investigation found that the shield plug, which covers the primary containment vessel, was deformed. The shield plug is around 600 millimeters thick, which is almost two feet thick, and the edges have been found to be displaced by 300 millimeters, or just under one foot. TEPCO just can't seem to build anything that lasts, with the exception of radioactive contamination. Good friend Umi Hagatani, one of our Japan connections, translated from the original TEPCO report and put together this summary. On February 12th, TEPCO announced that they detected 54,000 becquerels per liter of cesium-137 and 22,000 becquerels per liter of cesium-134, which is 30,000 times what was detected a week previously on February 6th. The level of cesium increased by 1.7 times overnight and is the highest since the first occurrence in March of 2011. Considering this high level of cesium-134 and 137 
It can be interpreted to mean that the meltdown at Daiichi is ongoing, but we are on the second phase, which is melt out and anticipating another critical mass. If this melted out debris reacts and reaches the point of critical mass, expanding emergency zone is necessary and the evacuation of every child and every woman under 40 years old to safer places such as Western Japan is suggested. Remember when TEPCO claimed cold shutdown had been achieved? My posterior. Meanwhile, the pro-nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency has given Japan permission to dump Fukushima toxic nuclear waste into the Pacific Ocean forever. According to their report, TEPCO is advised to perform an assessment of the potential radiological impact to the population and the environment arising from the release of water containing tritium and any other residual radionuclides into the sea. It is clear that final decision-making will require engaging all stakeholders, including TEPCO and nuclear authorities, central and regional governments, and local communities, it said. What about the people? The children, their mothers. What about the rest of us who live on or near the Pacific Ocean? Are we not stakeholders? IAEA, who made you God? On a better note, the Fukushima Prefectural Dental Association has started a five-year study to measure radiation levels in baby teeth to better determine the health effects of the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident. Radiation tends to collect in baby teeth as they develop and does not metabolize, giving researchers the opportunity to take accurate measurements of radiation exposure when the child was younger. It was this exact same procedure in Operation Tooth Fairy in the late 1950s that gathered evidence of strontium-90 in baby teeth in America and elsewhere. These findings directly contributed to President John F. Kennedy signing the Limited Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty in 1963. This current project, supported by the Environment Ministry of Japan, will be the first in that country to use teeth to analyze radiation exposure. However, there's no word in this planned study about having teeth from children born after 3-11-11. Dr. Shigeru Mita, a Tokyo physician, is making waves with his insistence that it is time to consider evacuating Tokyo. It's a long story, and we will have a link up on the website, but among the quotes are, I've mostly tested patients living in Tokyo, and I found a lot of harmful symptoms in children, especially in kindergarten students or elementary school students. I've also seen some serious effects in the elderly. I can't prescribe anything to these patients, because there aren't any medicines to help. We need to be taking these tests for at least 20 years to know the true effects, and there hasn't been nearly enough done in the time since the meltdown. We will have that link available. And journalist Mari Takanuchi, founder of Save Kids Japan, is facing charges for the crime of advocating moving families out of the contaminated areas around the failed and leaking Fukushima nuclear site. The charges are being brought by an individual from the Ethos Project, which pushes people to remain in contaminated areas and measure levels of contamination, rather than moving to safer areas. The group Independent WHO contends that Ethos in Japan is connected to the Ethos Project, which operated in the aftermath of Chernobyl. There, Ethos not only encouraged people to inhabit contaminated lands, they refused to take available measures to rid inhabitants' bodies of radioactive contamination. There's a petition to support Mari Takanuchi. We will have that link also up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode number 139. Bad news for Britain, as a new study shows that as many as 12 of Britain's 19 civil nuclear sites are at risk of flooding and coastal erosion because of climate change. This according to an unpublished government analysis obtained by The Guardian. Nine of the sites have been assessed by the Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs as being vulnerable now, while others are in danger from rising sea levels and storms in the future. The sites include all of the eight proposed for new nuclear power stations around the coast, 
as well as numerous radioactive waste stores, operating reactors, and defunct nuclear facilities. The Sellafield site in Cumbria is not only at risk of flooding, the estimated cost of cleaning up this reprocessing site has escalated to what has been labeled an astonishing 70 billion pounds, which is almost $117 billion in U.S. money. The report said progress had been poor and targets had been missed, and that the consortium brought in six years ago to help Sellafield improve its performance and had its contract extended just last October was responsible for spiraling costs and poor performance. Sellafield is located less than 100 miles from Ireland's east coast, and now comes word that changes to international law will leave the Irish free to sue British nuclear operators over contamination. This could result in lawsuits into the billions of pounds as the Irish government and Irish victims of any radioactive damage can now sue British nuclear operators. Booyah! Greenpeace has long warned that the dumping of the reprocessing plant's liquid waste has made the Irish Sea among the most contaminated waters in the world, even though Ireland itself produces no nuclear energy. Irish fishermen have been angered by catches of unsaleable, mutated fish and by findings that they have been exposed to low-level radiation. But Ireland's legal standing has been radically strengthened by amendments to the Paris Convention on Third-Party Liability in the field of nuclear energy. These amendments finally come into force this year, and the changes will allow anyone in Ireland affected by a nuclear accident that originates at a British site to seek up to one billion pounds in damages from the plant's operator in the High Court. Hit them in the only place they understand. Get them in the money, cojones. Before we get to this week's featured interview, I want to thank those of you who have donated to Nuclear Hot Seat now that the big red donate button is working. And yes, donations in the amount of a day's Starbucks fix or even a week's iTunes fix really do go a long way to help me meet the expenses that come with doing this program. So if you value the information you get from Nuclear Hot Seat, join in and support the weekly anti-nuclear news, NRC duck and cover report, Numb nuts of the week, all the rest. Show your support and know that whatever you can do to help, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now for this week's featured interview. Pradeep Indulkar is an award-winning Indian filmmaker currently touring the United States with his film, High Power. It's about the 40-year-old Tarapur nuclear power station in India and the problems being faced by the people there. This film won the 2013 Uranium Film Festival Yellow Oscar for Best Short Documentary. I spoke with Pradeep mid-tour and mid-snowstorm in New York. Pradeep Indulkar, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Let's start with a little bit of background. Where are you from in India, and how did you first become aware of nuclear issues in that country? I am from Mumbai in India, and uh, I worked in Nuclear Research Center in Mumbai uh, for 20 years, um, 1993 to 1994. And uh, there I came across these nuclear issues uh, because it's, uh, I was trained there. And uh, then especially these uh, health-related issues, because I suffered a lot in my service uh, in the last uh, three, four years, and that was the reason I left the job. And then I joined um, this uh, environment education field. In the last four or five years, uh, I am with uh, this Jaitapur uh, anti-nuclear uh, protest, uh, because Jaitapur is uh, very close to my native place. And that was the reason I joined this uh, anti-nuclear movement. What led you to decide to make a film about the Tower Pearl Nuclear Power Station? What were the issues there? Yeah, actually, while working with uh, the Itapur people, uh, my main uh, area of work was uh, awareness, uh, spreading uh, awareness among the uh, affected people, uh, those who are protesting against uh, a nuclear uh, project there. And then 
I found that uh, there is no good material available in the local language and local culture uh, where uh, people can get connected with that. Uh, because always we used to refer some foreign material from Europe and America and Russia about Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, so and that, that time I was also connected with uh, this uh, Tarapur people. The Tarapur is the first nuclear power plant very near to Mumbai, around 75 uh, miles towards the north of Mumbai. And I was talking to Tarapur people also and noting down their um, issues, their problems. And then somewhere I, uh, I, I got the idea that uh, why not we record this, everything on camera, and uh, so we can show it to other people who are fighting against the nuclear power plant, because Tarapur is the longest run uh, nuclear power plant in India, and uh, people have suffered a lot there. So I started recording their interviews, and that time actually my idea was not to have, make a film or something, but just to show the uh, their interviews. Do you have a background as a filmmaker at all? No, no, I was not having any background as a filmmaker. I just started recording uh, their interviews, and after recording their interviews, that I found that uh, it is so strong. The, uh, their interviews were so strong. Then I thought to make documentary film, but uh, of course the film uh, was my love and I was watching so many documentaries uh, for the last 3-4 years. Then I started learning about this uh, documentary making through books and all, and then I took the decision to make a documentary of this. Did you do this by yourself or did you have a team of people working with you? Once I decided to make this film, I approached um, so many people because I was not having fun to make the film and in India, you know, uh, nobody fun for anti-nuclear activities. So I was not having fun to um, make a film with a uh, big professional people and team. So I approached uh, so many people like editors and uh, uh, sound and uh, musicians and all. And I, uh, I discussed this issue with them, and I said that hey, this is a social issue, and uh, thousands and thousands of people are fighting against it. Right? So you should help them, and to help them, this is a good platform to give them help. And then so many people joined this, uh, many professionals uh, film make, uh, from the film industry joined this, and then this film has uh, took shape. At the same time, I was very much keen that artists, writers, and musicians, uh, celebrities of uh, Bollywood uh, should take some stand on this issue as a you know, social awareness. And then some artists, uh, some well-known artists like Tom Alter for English and uh, Vikram Gokhale is a national award winner artist. They joined this movement and uh, Tom Alter gave uh, his voice for English version and uh, Vikram Gokhale gave voice for Marathi version. And then this uh, film became a complete uh, as a film. What are the issues that you are bringing to the fore in this film? My intention when making this film was I was having two target groups uh, in front of me. One is the people who are fighting against nuclear power and another uh, group of people, which is a, a big group, who are using this power, who are the end user of this power. And they are not aware what is happening at the ground where the power is generated. So I want to make these people aware and these people get connected to the uh, nuclear struggle which is taking place in India at very uh, different places. So these were the target groups and at the same time I wanted to show to the world that Fukushima or Chernobyl can happen once uh, because uh, when, whenever there is a nuclear power people talk about Chernobyl, people talk about Fukushima but uh, being um, a nuclear technician I can say that Fukushima and Chernobyl it happens after 25 years or something, but the, all the nuclear power plants, around 440 nuclear power plants which are working today uh, all over the world, they are a small Fukushima, they are small 
Chernobyl. And that was my main intention to show this world that all the power plant people who are living around the nuclear power plant, they are suffering the same thing which the Fukushima people are suffering today, but at the small level. So there are so many small, 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 small Fukushima and Chernobyl all over the world today. When you were making the film, did you experience any opposition from pro-nuclear forces regarding power force? Yeah, actually, while making the film, there are a lot of problems because going in that area, talking to people and filming their actual, taking the unit, the camera and bringing the people on road, it was really a bit uh, difficult because uh, there is a lot of vigilance going on in that area, so many security issues are there. But anyhow, we have uh, done that um, in spite of that. But I found a big trouble after making this film because, uh, you know, in India there is a censor board and we need uh, to have a censor certificate before publishing this film or to have uh, public shows. So I applied for censor certificate uh, somewhere in February 2013. Generally, they censor any film within two or three weeks, but after three or four months, they informed me that we cannot give certificate. So I said that why you can't give? You give me some reason or some, some cuts. You suggest me some cuts so I can think on that. What is objectionable in this film? They said that uh, no, there is no some sentence or some scene or some dialogue objectionable, but the entire subject is objectionable. So I said that I, can, I cannot uh, scrap the whole subject and whole film, but I will appeal uh, your uh, decision. So I appealed to the uh, higher committee. The higher committee also uh, took again uh, another three, four months. Then, then again, uh, after having a lot of discussions and debate over these issues and uh, content of the film, finally they gave me certificate just uh, recently, somewhere in August, September. So in that period, I was not able to show this film anywhere in India. But I had uh, shows in Brazil uh, while uh, Iranian Film Festival was going on where I got a uh, yellow Oscar. How has the film been received by those who have seen it in India? These five uh, shows, in these five shows, I got a very good response because uh, people were not much aware about this. And there was a big discussion about uh, the whole issue. One thing was that uh, the physical things like uh, they have not got good compensation, they were not good cost for their land and their jobs and all. But the main issue was their health problem. And I've, uh, these people are suffering the different diseases and illnesses. Then the Mumbai people got a bit scared, a bit aware that it can happen to the Mumbai people if, if something goes wrong with that plan. Because Mumbai is not far away uh, from Tarapur, just 75 miles. And mainly all the water which is coming to Mumbai, it comes in that area. So I said that if if uh, something goes wrong, or might be today, even today, uh, something must be coming in the water. And uh, you can uh, get affected because a uh, lot many fruits are coming in that area, fishes are coming from that area. So we, Mumbai people are connected with uh, Tarapur because it's just uh, very near to Mumbai. Kai Power was awarded the 2013 Yellow Oscar for Best Short Documentary by the Iranian Film Festival. How has that impacted you and what has that done for the film's future? Yellow Oscar helped a lot to this film uh, for getting it screen all over the world, I can say, because I, after, just after Yellow Oscar, and during the Yellow Oscar also, we had three shows in Rio, teaching Rio, and then after Yellow Oscar, I got the invitations from Europe, especially from Germany and France, and I was very much interested in France, because France is directly connected to Jaitapur, and their state company, Areva, uh, is uh, the contractor for Jaitapur. So I was very much interested in France and got accepted very good in France. And then uh, in Germany also, because German, uh, there are 150 companies in Germany 
uh, who are supplier of uh, Arriva and uh, around 5,000 people are working with uh, Arriva in Germany. And then after Germany and after this Europe tour, I got uh, many uh, invitations from uh, American universities. And now I am on tour for years. So this uh, yellow Oscar helped a lot. How long are you going to be in the United States, and what are some of the places you're going to be showing the film so that listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat in the area can come and watch it and meet you and hear about the issues in India? I'm in uh, yes, since the 1st of February, and I'll be here till 18th of March. And uh, I had almost eight to nine shows uh, in the U.S. so far from Boston and Northampton and Burlington and New York. We had a year in film festival in Washington. We had a year in film festival. And now I am in Delaware uh, University. Then I'll be going to Philadelphia, then New Jersey, then Pittsburgh, and then Chicago. And then I'm, I'll be going to Arizona. And then on the uh, West Coast, I have two shoes, one in Auckland and another in San Jose. People who, who are interested, they can visit the website of this film, that is uh, high power, H-I-G-H-P-O-W-E-R, uh, doc, W-E-P-S, dot com. And we will have a link to that up on the website at nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode number 139. If high power could have the exact impact you wanted to have, what would that be? I think that the high power should connect the people all over the world, especially from US, uh, Europe, and Japan, to the people who are fighting in India against the nuclear power plant, and those people who are suffering with the nuclear power plant in India. Especially in, uh, I am in US because, uh, you know, whatever is happening in uh, India about the nuclear power plant, US is directly connected because all the nuclear activities in India increased, uh, like nuclear material, nuclear export and import, and all these things. So, especially after 2005, the nuclear activities in India has increased, and the uh, Indian government uh, wants to go from 3% to 20%. So I feel that uh, if uh, the people of America and people of Europe and Japan, if they talk to their government, their representatives, that all over the world when people are rejecting this nuclear power, the governments are going back to uh, their own resources. Why Indian government should go uh, for this nuclear power? When they have very good natural resources like solar and wind and biomass. Uh, so the people from all over the world, they should bring more pressure on their representatives and government as well. Now, if listeners would like to either book a showing of the film, possibly with you with it or maybe not, or if there is a way for them to buy a copy of a DVD, what do they need to do? Yeah, they can write me uh, on my email, P R A D W E P I N D U L K A R at hotmail.com. So I can send the DVD. Pradeep Indulkar, thank you so much for being my guest today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks a lot, Libby. We will, of course, have his links up on our website. And now, here's Radcast. This is Mimi German for Radcast.org, bringing you the Radcast Report. Today is Tuesday, February 18th, 2014, three weeks away from the third anniversary of the worst nuclear power plant atrocity in the history of humankind, Fukushima Daiichi. We've had numerous lessons on nuclear hot seat regarding radiation readings and how to understand those readings on our Radcast maps. Today, I would like to take some time to thank some of our newest readers by simply sharing their radiation readings with you. Salisbury, Massachusetts, current average in counts per minute, 44, with a high of 74. It's been snowing there, and the snow has been relatively hot. Oneonta, New York, is 38. Jackson Heights, New York, these are all new readers, 34 counts per minute. 
Woodbury, Connecticut is 35 counts per minute. And this person also gives us reading in sieverts. And that would be 0 0.104 microsieverts an hour. St. Paul, Minnesota, 33 counts per minute. Frontier, Michigan, giving us a reading in microsieverts of 0 0.14. Lewiston, Idaho, 31 counts per minute. Farmington, Minnesota, 38. Rapid City, South Dakota. This is a constant reader. I love this person in South Dakota. 44 counts per minute. Tonino, Washington is 34. Olympia, Washington is 26. Petaluma, California is 43. We have a new reader in Folsom, California. Thank you, Folsom. Giving us readings in sieverts. This is 0 0.15 micro sieverts. If you have questions, feel free to email me at info at radcast.org. This is Mimi Gurman for the Radcast Report on the Nuclear Hot Seat. Hey everyone, mark your calendars. My ebook is now set for release a week from this Thursday, February 27th. The name has been changed back to the original. I couldn't help it, sorry. But it's Yes, I Glow in the Dark, a very personal nuclear reaction, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's a memoir. No, it's a nuclear cautionary tale. No, it's a primer on how to get active. Wait, it's all three. So I'm asking everyone who hears this in time to buy the ebook on February 27 because it will help me in my market ranking. If you don't buy it then, no worry, you can buy it afterwards. And of course, I'm working to still put up that free excerpt on NuclearHotSeat.com, but A. Weber does not make it easy. When this happens, I'll let you know via Facebook. Activist shoutouts this week. My thanks to Catherine Wind Euler for her assistance in the WIPP story. Beverly Finlay Kaneko for her link to all things from Japan. Scott Portsline for a correction on the Three Mile Island conference dates at the University of Pennsylvania. The actual dates are March 27 and 28, so if you heard something last week, just ignore it. This is the right way. Erica Gray, always great with the NRC report, and ongoing gratitude to Joni Ray for helping me to get this program posted to YouTube. By the way, you can now get the show every week by subscribing to Nuclear Hot Seat Videos on YouTube. You'll even receive a notice in your email when each show posts. How cool is that? Here's the week's final thought. That's the sound of the stream that I go to. It's tough working on the nuclear issue. So my encouragement to everyone who hears this is find something that sustains you that has nothing to do with nuclear and embrace it with all your heart. If you can get to nature, go there. If you've got a person, hug them. If you've got a dog or a cat, hug them. But don't let yourself be isolated with the information. It will wear you down to a nubbin if you do. So refresh, renew, get your bearings back, and then go get them. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 18, 2013. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, CNN, LA Times, Carlsbad, Current, Argus, News West 9, KTVI-TV, RT.com, Asahi Shimbun, World Crunch, Voice of Russia, Informable.com, and Lucas Hickson, Umihagatani, Fukushima Emergency, What We Can Do, dot blogspot, dot fr, Vice .com, Credo, TheGuardian.com, BBC.co.uk, Independent.co.uk, World Nuclear News, TEPCO, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Our archive is available on iTunes or at NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog. All comments welcome, as long as you keep them civil. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have my permission to reuse as long as you provide proper attribution and website. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that San Onofre is still shut down forever, and we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all 
in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.